Good evening to all the speakers and the participants who are present here for this SCR for South Asia seminar. We are delighted to have you for the first webinar on AI for the next billion. I, Pranjal Jain, one of the co-organizers of the SCR for South Asia initiative, would like to first take you through the background story of SCR for South Asia. SCI, which means human computer interaction, is a multidisciplinary field of study focusing on the design of computer technology, and in particular, the interaction between humans and computers. This initiative is to bring people together from academia, industry, and government, and in SCI in design, with a research focus on India, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka which are collectively known as South Asian countries. We invite all of you as well as individuals across the globe who are researching and or are planning to explore the South Asian context on SCI topics, including and beyond development. The intention of bringing all of you together is twofold. First, to create a community where healthy discussions and exchange of knowledge happens without boundaries. Second, to build SCI and design education curriculum in South Asian countries. SCI for South Asia started with the application on Sikkai Development Fund. Here are the people who wrote that application in 2020 and which gave the birth of SCI for South Asia. Rahar Jangi, Dil Rukshi, Rucha, Suleiman Devanuj, Nova, Sayan, and myself, Pranjal we welcome everyone to join this initiative, students, early career researchers, academicians, and professionals are all are welcome to contribute and give us feedback how to improve this initiative. For any more information, you could have a look at our website. Before jumping towards the main agenda of the day, it is important to highlight that 25th March is an important day as it marks the 50th Independence Day of Bangladesh. And the month of March also marks the birth centenary of the father of the nation, Banga Bandhu Sheikh Mohammed Rahman. We are also delighted to tell you that we are organizing a workshop in Kai 2021, whose purpose is to define new vision and mission for SCI researchers in South Asia. We invite participants across the globe interested in working with and for the South Asian context. The organizers for this workshop are Pushpinda Singh, Devanish Parth, Balkrishan, Nova Ahmed, Suleiman Rashid, Mohit Jain, Deepak Ranjan Pari, Raha Jhangir, Lubna Razak, Priyank Chandra, Rucha Tulastar, Dhruv Jain, Delrukshi Gami, Nilavra Bhattacharya, Anupriya Tuli, Sumita Sharma, Samia Sistabhasam, and myself Pranjil Jain. Now coming on the, day, on the agenda of the day, AI for the next billion. We are privileged to have an esteemed speaker with us for this panel, starting with Dr. Payal Arora, Dr. Mariane Kinula, Divi Thakka, Dr. Shaima Lazim, Dr. Neha Kumar and Azara Smile. Okay, let's go ahead and start with our first and our keynote speaker, Professor Payal Arora. She is the professor and chair in technology of the values and global media culture at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, Netherlands. She is also the academic director at the Erasmus Center for Data Analytics and Rotterdam School of Management. And she's also author of our, the book, which is also the title of our today's presentation, which is AI for the next video. So Professor Aurora, you have the platform, please. Thank you. So let me share the slides. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you'll have to stop your slides. Or can I just go ahead? Yeah, you'll have to stop before I, yeah. or maybe I can just go ahead, yeah. Okay, 
All right, firstly, I want to thank everyone, uh, thank the committee particularly for getting this initiative going. I must say it's the about time, right? I'm sure many of you agree because I remember this conversation more than a decade ago uh, when the Chinese internet studies had taken, uh, you know, pay, uh, place and uh, really rooted itself in a very uh, targeted conversation. And we, many of us had this conversation of why aren't we doing something similar? right, for uh, the South Asian context. So I am absolutely thrilled. And, you know, I'm also happy to be part of this community of people I've been reading, working with, and I know for many, many years. So uh, I hope for much more fruitful collaboration. So, all right, with that, uh, let me get started in respect for the time. And by the way, for those who are curious about what uh, happened. This new look of mine is going to go on for a while, apparently. So my free advice is when you're walking on the street, strolling on the street, how about looking in front of you? Because I pretty much bumped into, well, uh, yeah, basically hit my head on a street pole, which is rather embarrassing at emergency services where they wondered what could possibly have caused all this blood coming down my face is, well, I'm a professor, absent-minded, and I don't really see where I'm going. So anyway, that was really it. But all right, so let's get started. Um, my talk today, of course, is about the AI for the next billion. And I think, let me give you an example of a conversation I had in a course that I teach, which is called the AI for social good. Uh, so basically, it was uh, we were focusing on one of these AI uh, tools called Trail Guard, or multiple of these uh, sort of uh, anti-poaching AI-driven tools by the likes of Intel, Cisco, Microsoft. A lot of these players have gotten on board, and for good reason, right? Uh, today, if you see the BBC articles, it talks about the near extinction of elephants across South Asia, for example, Africa and elsewhere. And so it's a serious issue. And uh, basically there's a lot of hope that AI driven tools will make a difference and will you know, save these animals from extinction. So part of the conversation in the class was asking what could we do to enhance, we had to study these tools like the Intel, Intel's trail guard and see, so I divided the groups of students and asked them, how can they see, uh, uh, how could they boost it to make it much more societally impactful, right? So after 10 to 15 minutes of major discussion, they came back and almost all of them had a suggestion for the rest of the class. And that being that it needs to be topped up, supplemented with a shoot to kill technology of basically any kind of poachers. So the way their suggestion of oh, these are I'm talking about master's level students is that these technologies are able to basically detect poachers in the national forest and once they detect them, they should shoot them and kill them because it takes too long for them for the rangers to come and rescue the animals right. So I changed context and I said, all right, so we're in Amsterdam and there's this Dutch police and he sees a person with a hammer ready to kill a cat. Okay, a very cute little cat. So should we shoot, should the Dutch police shoot that person? The students are like, obviously not. We live in a civilized country. I mean, you know, human beings matter more than animals and we, you know, what about, we can't just shoot people just because they're going to commit a crime. And, you know, the, uh, so it was very interesting because basically what we have here is an issue of empathy. Clearly certain groups enjoy more empathy than others. Some like poachers in, you know, the South Asian context should be shot on spot, right? Without actually considering the reasons why they are poaching in the first place, which is deeply rooted in poverty, as we many of you may uh, guess already, right? Uh, there's a huge ivory consumption demand, deep poverty in these contexts often, and encroachment, which leads to these situations. So, you know, you have those groups lacking the levels of empathy evoked and other groups uh, for example, Dutch citizens gaining much more empathy. So it emphasizes a point that 
you know, that basically empathy is learned and not an innate response. And we need to understand and sort of foster as a community the learnings uh, so as to deepen our understandings of the motivations of why certain groups of people do what they do, what are their aspirations, concerns, so as to rehumanize the what I call the marginalized majority. Because the fact is that much of the services and goods and technologies that are created have this user type in mind. And this is across sectors, not just development sectors, right? If you look at the healthcare sector, more than 80% of the user group is white male middle class in the United States. And that's uh, for clinical trial patients. If you look at the design of the mobile phone, it was designed as a default with a male palm in mind. If you look at crash test dummies for cars, the default is a male or with uh, basically um, male uh, uh, as a prototype. And um, well, if you look at the way in which temperature regulation takes place in offices, it's set to the metabolic rates of men, which is 20%, uh, creates 20% more inefficiencies amongst women because it's no temperature. And I can just go on and on. We have vast amounts of evidence. So what we have here is both a data glut and a data deficit, a data glut of a certain kind of user group, that being, you know, Western, white male, you know, middle class, and a data deficit in terms of what I call the marginalized majority or what is now popularly known as the next billion users that are fast coming online. So these practices become even more insidious because they are exported to the rest of the world without much thought in terms of design and policy and implementation. So my book, uh, The Next Women Users, basically is accumulation of more than a decade and a half of my ethnographic research as I am a digital anthropologist and I spent more than a decade and a half looking into how low-income users, low-income uh, young people, particularly in communities like uh, in uh, favelas in India, uh, slum, I mean, sorry, favelas in Brazil, slums in India, townships in Africa and elsewhere, uh, have been using mobile media. And more in the terms of their everyday usage, what motivates them, what are their aspirations, their concerns. And of course, this is in tandem with the rich ethnographic and other kinds of work that are done by actually a community very much out here, including my esteemed panelists. So together we have come up with a strong narrative, which is obvious to many of us, but not so much to designers, practitioners, policymakers, is that much of these populations are very much like you and I. We, they are, you know, have similar kinds of aspirations and similar kinds of concerns. And we need to rehumanize them if we proceed forward in a very ethical, responsible uh, way. So I'd like to focus on the five Fs because, you know, it's, it's uh, what's interesting about, uh, since my book came out in 2019, is I've been talking a lot to a lot of tech companies, actually a variety of very different uh, organizations that have surprised me. Like for example, global seed companies have approached me, solar panel companies, um, name it. It's, it's, uh, I just spoke last week to financial investors in the Netherlands, right? So very unusual audiences that I did not actually have in mind when I wrote this book. But of course, it has become this deep market that everybody wants a slice of, right? Disturbingly, The Economist had a feature uh, saying, well, then basically about the next billion users and who is going to get a slice of their pie, very right? sort of neo-colonial, like let's start to carve them up in terms of let's commodify them as fast as possible. So, you know, there is, of course, the need to pay deep attention to their actual 
concerns and to protect them. And so rather than actually not engage them, I'm engaging with a lot of these companies, but rather than rather than offering them the five steps to you know quickly commodify them is to open a conversation of how do we create responsible ethical ai based technologies that can actually do genuinely good service and actually become instruments for positive social change so it starts with just you know and this is what my also my book kind of covers in terms of these uh five little slices is that we have to recognize that these uh, populations are not utility driven beings. And this is something to me very intuitive and we have the evidence today, right? And many of you who've already been in the field know what I'm talking about is that when they are faced with mobile technologies, they are most motivated by uh, very everyday reasons of entertainment, Bollywood, Tollywood, you know, uh, socializing with each other, romance, the hope for romance. Uh, gaming and much of the, uh, the data, uh, even uh, you know, is diverted towards these purposes. And now we even have the facts of um, you know when you have Geo, which has looked closely at the data and even designed their marketing principles on the ABCD principle, which is that Indian users, for example, divert most of their data on astrology. Uh, Bollywood, cricket, and devotion. And that's the kind of content, and we need to understand that. And that's their premise, right? So here you have Sumit Jain, who became this massive TikTok influencer with millions of views by doing something simple in terms of his dance moves, right? And it has brought a lot of these tier two and tier three people in a sort of a, a way of visibility, uh, self actualization, particularly in communities where they don't get to you know, be recognized for their multifaceted personalities because these are often in very deeply conservative societies where they're supposed to follow a particular, you know, um, image, particularly for women, of course, where they're supposed to preserve their honor, their reputation. And so sometimes, you know, social media can create a pathway where they can express themselves a little more widely, admittedly far more for male than female. So, this I have to emphasize more because while leisure is something which is fundamental for self actualization and opens up the sort of room to self discovery and also thereby sort of in a collective action. What is astonishing amongst typical policymakers today is that the hierarchy of needs model is still very much a realistic way of approaching these populations, which is the 60s Maslow pyramid, where the theory, which by the way, is completely debunked today, but continues to hold credibility in spite of the evidence, is that low income populations have to go through a pyramid of needs. First, they have to satisfy their physiological, safety, social esteem, and only then will they start to think about self-actualization. But for any of you who have actually been in the field, which I know many of you have, you know this is completely untrue because it's actually the reverse. It's we have to flip the pyramid. Self-actualization is a main driver. And for many years, actually, Nimi Rangaswamy and I have been pushing forth how these uh, have been the essential gateway into the way in which people uh, experience the internet for the first time and also sustain their uh, sort of commitment to these new technologies. The second aspect, which is about flexibility is, you know, springs from, of course, decades of work, like, you know, the pop book Jugard Innovation, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which came out about a decade ago, celebrating the improvisation of low income communities. And of course, there were a lot of problematics about, you know, uh, doing that because Jugard Innovation was criticized for, you know, not actually then institutionalizing, coming up with serious reforms structurally because they felt well poverty can stimulate innovation so why disrupt something that's good and that can actually be roped in by companies in the west to gain insights right for their own products and services so there was a disjuncture but it doesn't take away from the fact that it emphasized something very important is that majority of the next billion users 
have a very precarious existence? When is the next paycheck coming from? Where is the next job going to be? Should they be moving to Dubai? Should they be moving to Philippines? Where is the journey going to lead them? The everyday paycheck, which is not going to be a postpaid, but a prepaid, right? So, and that actually is very essential to keep in mind, but also just as much they amazing resilience in coping with these precarious conditions, which, you know, as you see a lot of these kinds of photos is how did they improvise in a way to satisfy some of the needs, aspirations and desires that much is very much normal and very much part of the everyday fabric. So, um, you know, precarity is something that has been very important. And in the last year and a half, I, uh, along with Usha Raman from University of Hyderabad, have set up the feminist uh, Fem Lab initiative, which is feminist approaches to digital labor collectives. And this is really putting the low income women workers at the heart of design development and storytelling. So we're looking right now at uh, these populations in Bangladesh and India across multiple different sectors where they're very dominant from garment to artisanal to construction. And you can check the website and I would love it if uh, those who are doing work on this would you know, connect so we can uh, expand on this community. But what we are noticing already from our uh, work is that uh, there is indeed a lot of precarity, particularly even more so amplified with women and then it becomes you know you add the intersectionality layer and then it becomes even more uh, significant a barrier but that being said it is really important to recognize that collectivizing the informal collective collectivizing that doesn't get captured by the formal unions for example where they often are excluded and the way in which they're using digital technologies and to sort of like move away from just the sort of, uh, you know, victimhood narrative and also showcase just as much the emancipatory uh, narrative in terms of how certain kinds of formalizing, professionalizing of, uh, you know, so-called gig work that enable them, say, for example, a female salon worker using urban company to feel much more respected, for example, right? So anyway, I'm happy to talk more about this in a Q&A, but again, this brings in flexibility in a very nuanced way, which makes us try to question to what degree should it be formalized, in what ways should it be formalized, does formalization also mean professionalization, uh, and are these actually being, to what degree are they being auto automated and dehumanized, right? Because professionalization could be interpreted as optimization which actually can lead to further dehumanization. Uh, and we can talk more in Q&A. So the third part is fusion. We have to recognize that when we are looking at AI des uh, design technologies, what is happening are the super app uh, ecosystems within which we are developing um, these products and services. So it is something that is really, you know, when we are looking at our own little segment of site, we have to understand the interrelationships between multiple other kinds of services. For example, I may be very interested in just healthcare, but often it is bundled with fintech services, uh, you know, uh, digital, uh, you know, uh, ed edutainment services, so as to boost literacy by collaborating with pop stars at the local level and a variety of other solar panel experts, policymakers. And I've been involved with a number of these initiators from healthcare to, uh, you know, uh, connectivity, especially right now, I'm on the advisory board for the UNESCO uh, committee on this purposes with UNHCR too. So it is interesting to see the conversations being shaped and how can we look at it in a way which can respect the design thinking approach and yet allow for depth, right? And uh, the fourth part is about friction. Now, often we think about design as an art of effortlessness, but actually critical friction and thoughtful friction can be very important, is basically a sort of a pause before action because it can actually be very important in protecting the users from themselves and from bad actors, like a lot of scammers, as we have read across board, whether it's cyber scams, which 
can amass to millions of euros from internet romance scams to, you know, QR code, sort of uh, fake IDs and the like. And that has much more devastating consequences, particularly on the next burn users who are coming online for the first time and have to face these uh, very formidable sort of uh, environments which can uh, deter them, particularly for women. So, and the last point, because in respect for time, because I think I'm almost over, is fabulousness. And what I mean by that is that uh, there's a story about uh, Shenzhen, which was, you know, decades ago, was a sort of a low key back office for hardware in China. And uh, they basically were a zone of innovation and creating these very basic essential technologies. But what they realized very quickly is even though people who with very scarce income, um, they still wanted design. They wanted something cool. They wanted a, cons they are conspicuous consumers. And conspicuous consumption has been a long documented sort of um, process and uh, sort of a, way of engagement amongst low income communities for a variety of purposes and reasons. That being that it is a signal for status, that is a way to build networks. But the fact is that low income communities tend to overspend uh, on an average product or service, especially if it has a certain uh, status marker than may be you and I in terms of a percentage of our income, which includes, by the way, data plans, right? So, you know, what we, and we look at as essential is actually a luxury good for them. So, yeah, I will stop here, but for those who are interested in any of the resources, these, this, a lot of this comes from the works that I have been writing for the last few uh, years and, um, particularly the most recent ones, uh, along with some of my colleagues. So um, yeah, you can reach out to me if you don't have access. And I thank you for your time. I will stop now. Thank you, Dr. Paira Laura. Um, it was insightful to listen to your presentation. If any one of you have questions, uh, I would request to put those questions in the Q&A. We could take those questions from there. And Robert, your hand is raised. Uh, do you, if you have any question, you could also type there and you could take the question from the box. Um, but we have a first question asking, um, when you say a typical user, they are uh, pointing to the fact that we miss, we're missing out the diversity and inclusion. Yeah, I mean, it's beyond that, right? Because if you just look at the sheer number, what is a typical user is actually not those people in the West. It is actually, if you look at just the sheer number, it's actually people outside in the global South and especially low income communities, they are the norm. So it's not about including them in terms of diversity. It's firstly recognizing that we have been designing products, services, policies for a sliver of the world's population and we put them as the norm. And that has been always, this is part of the whole decolonizing momentum that have been, has been going on for decades. But it seems like such a sticky factor just because it is all about the power and politics of where you know, these kinds of uh, technologies are emerging from, from Silicon Valley and elsewhere. But so it's, it's beyond diversity, right? Now look at what's, of course, things are changing. I was very happy to learn that, and for some of you know, Avaz, uh, which is a podcast uh, platform, was inspired deeply. They came from Geo. So it was a bunch of designers and developers from Geo that realized that instead of including the next burn users on a later stage, they're going to start with them at the center of their company. And they only cater to them in terms of what are their needs because their logic is that they are the majority and the others are we can include in terms of diversity, really flipping it and they're doing very well. So by default, it has to be in multiple languages. It has to be accessible. It has to be the they, they pilots are happening in tier two and tier three cities. I find that really remarkable and it makes sense, right? Because of the oral cultures, the semi-literacy rates. And so these are the kinds of organizations who have 
the courage and conviction and have the data behind them to say, you know what, we need to understand and it's not a problem, it's not a high risk to cater to the norm. Uh, and that's what they're doing. And I think that is uh, very exciting to see that shift. Thank you. We have more questions coming in, which is always exciting. Uh, so the second question is asked by Grace Eden. Uh, why frame Southeast Asians as consumers? Are these studies for the internet of building a consultancy for mega corporations that view people as markets? Yeah, so it's a very good question. And look, I also, it, I struggled with that initially just by the name of my book, The Next Billion Users, which clearly puts them as the, you know, if you're a non-user, which by the way is many women, you know, a significant majority of women in low-income communities in the global South are non-users or shall we say, um, you know, uh, indirect users. And so they technically don't get included. But I did it deliberately and I'm glad I did because I wanted to have societal impact. I'm tired of being in the ivory tower. I'm tired of talking to other academics. We all agree about this. I wanted Facebook. I want basically a development agency that I criticize like completely and I tear them apart in my book. I want other kinds of companies to recognize and have a conversation with me and it worked. So since my book came out, every tech company from Google, Facebook have invited me to ta talk to them. Telecom companies have uh, invited me. Initially, of course, because they thought, oh, she's gonna deliver something to me. And I complicate the conversation because if we don't do it as academics, who will, right? So it's my way, it's almost like a Trojan horse. I get in because they look at it as a nice coffee table book. I'm sure none of them have read it. And then I have thoughtful conversation and already I have some good news is like UNHCR has uh, also approached me and they have designed their work plan for this year based on the book where it's gonna look at these populations as open mind in very open-minded terms, not in terms of conditionalities to give conditional, conditional internet access to refugees, but actually to understand the complexity of aspirations, behaviors, and put leisure, digital leisure at the center to see what are the complexities of uh, motivations that get them to be driven so they can be catered to. And that's really the purpose is that I use that as a Trojan horse. And of course I know what it sounds like, but I did it in a deliberate strategy, right? So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I know many academics would find that, you know, um, sort of, oh, that could be misleading and it, it could actually be feeding into uh, a already common trope, but it is what you do when you have your foot in the door that counts because it's time that academia really breaks out of their ivory towerness. And, you know, it, 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 we need every piece of help that we can get right now for us to shift and become, uh, I would say, academic activists, shall we say, right? So that's, that's really where it came from and for better or worse. Okay, we have the next question is, how do you think people can appropriately trust AI, avoiding over and under trust, especially considering South Asia context and your idea of fiction? Yeah, so I think um, firstly, trust is something which cannot be just delivered through you know, redesign, that's for sure, right? I mean, it comes from a larger and much more painstakingly dem like reform for uh, rethinking institutional logics and structures, which goes to the heart of why, you know, certain kinds of inequalities keep getting reproduced one generation after another, right? So that's something that like, for example, the media systems, the, the way in which they are incentivized, the kinds of news that gets out, these are, you know, it's not about uh, digital trust or non-trust, it's about, sources that earn trustworthiness, right? So there's a difference between trust and trustworthiness. And so it's, it's I think it's, um, it, that being said, it does matter 
the way in which you can create transparencies by having small incremental changes, but can make a big difference. Also in terms of just basic accountability, for example, the time period, uh, the time period it takes for companies to respond to, you know, um, uh, users who flag it and learn from that using, you know, uh, deep learning as a way so that com communities don't need to flag certain kinds of content anymore where the damage can be done, but preemptively can protect them. And they are doing a certain amount. Like if you look at Facebook and its efforts after its deep criticism, after the deep criticism in Myanmar, um, they did significantly change their interactions and improve their AI, right? And it's been documented very well in an article by Rest of World, for example, uh, and a number of other incidents. But um, I do think that that way we can actually push technology companies to doing their bit, but their bit is still a bit. Obviously we need other parts of the equation, including policy reform, institutional rethinking, including like the trust of a platform is like, uh, we are doing gig work in uh, South Asia. It's like a lot of our workers are wondering, why did I get this review? Why did I get this rating? Why am I invisible at this point? And why did my colleague get this work for the salon service? What did I do wrong? So this, this needs to be much more, uh, you know, transparent. And I think part of it is we need an outside auditing, but also much more active independent board of thinkers, activists, doers for each context, each country to be actively involved. As many of you have already tuned in about Facebook is now at last getting an independent auditing board for their content because they realize their limits a little too late, but <laughs> better late than never. But even that, you know, who gets to be selected on that board? Why, why one board? Why not each country getting their own board? So there's a lot of, I mean, it's obviously the beginning and very, very late, but it's, it has to happen, right? So there's a many non-technological interventions such as this, which will allow for serious change, I think. Yes, thank you for that response. Yeah, often we wonder that in the tech world, it is first the tech doing the job and then the policy and other things playing catch up because they are trying to do what they have been doing in the past.